Good morning, Sagemont Church. Pastor Matt here, and welcome to our final Sunday of our summer preaching series. I have the honor and privilege of introducing to you today a man named Sean Lovejoy. Um, I have known Sean for a really long time. He was the founding pastor of a church in Georgia that when he planted it, it exploded, became a mega church. And then after that, he felt the calling of God on his life to begin a ministry called Courage to Lead. And so he's the founder and CEO of that organization, which equips and trains leaders and pastors literally all over the world. One thing that's interesting about Sean is that Sean was the very first person to ever invite me to preach at a conference. I was a young church planner, had no idea what I was doing, but he saw something in me before I ever saw anything in myself. And so, Sean, thank you for believing in me. We're so excited that you're here. And so, Sagemont Church, would you give a warm welcome to Sean Lovejoy? Well, good morning, Sagemont. Good morning, Metro Houston. How are you doing? Uh, four of you are doing well. I said, how are we doing, Sagemont Church? Good, good. Glad you're here. If you've been here a long time, I'm glad you're here. Welcome to our summer series that wraps up. Pastor Matt will be back. If you're a guest, you were hoping to hear him today. Guest preacher's here. But I'll be honest with you, I think I preach a little better than him anyway. So, um, no, we've been friends a long time, and it's just my honor to come and be a part of his new home um, here at Sagemont. And I've known he and his pastor, Jim, uh, his wife, Jim, for a long time and love them dearly, and I, I know them personally, and I can follow a leader who's the same on stage as they are backstage. You know what I'm saying? And I can tell you this about Pastor Matt, like he's a good husband, he's a good man, he's a good father, he loves his kids, he loves being involved in their lives, and he's never um, put the church before his first point of ministry, his family, and I can follow a leader like that. How about you? So it's my honor to speak on his behalf today and give him the Sunday off. He deserves it some this summer. And he's been storing up, okay? He's been out a few weeks now. He's gonna come. He may preach two and a half hours next Sunday. Um, so, so be ready. He's going to come, you know, just anointed and appointed by God. And he's probably watching this, you know, at home if I know him. So, Matt, I love you. Enjoy your family today. And I'll see you soon, my friend. Um, in the meantime, I, I've been praying I've been praying for you. I've been praying for this church. I've been praying that God would speak to me. I don't know if you came expecting to hear from God today. If you're not expecting it, you probably won't get it. Just say. So I don't know if you came ready today expecting to hear from the Lord, but I always think it's good to pause about right now. And let's just say, God, quiet our minds. Okay. Wipe out of our minds the Mexican restaurant we have on right now, okay? And, and it's Tex-Mex here, I forget, right? Right? Let's wipe all that out of our minds and let's ask God to speak to us because we need it, don't we? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we may not acknowledge it, we may not recognize it, may, have, may not have gotten up thinking about it, but we need you. We're desperate for you. We have no hope outside of you. Great are you, Lord. We're not great. You're great. And you're the only hope we have. You're the only hope our country has. You're the only hope our world has. You're the only, world, only hope this church has. Our marriages have. Our kids have. Our finances have. And we just confess and acknowledge right now in the stillness of this moment, we need to hear from you. So speak to me, Lord. Speak through me. Speak in spite of me. And use me. Speak, Lord. We're listening now. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'm a blessed man. Got a great, great, great family. Um, my daughter, Madison, is with me this morning. Um, she's going off to Auburn University in a week. Um, so this is our last trip as a family. Wave your hand so they can see you down there, maybe Madison or whatever. I, I feel most successful because all my kids love the Lord and love the church. And we'll talk about that. I brought a picture of my family. Um, this, is, this is all of my family. This is not a great, you can't see our faces great, but this was intentional. Um, this was last week in Yosemite National Park. My dad turned 80 years old and it was a bucket list item. 
And I took him to Yosemite National Park. That's my wife of 28 years, my son, Paul, Madison, my Hannah, who's now five months pregnant, and my son-in-law, who's not good enough for her. (laughs) I'm going to be a grandfather in November, you guys. I can't believe it. And I'm going to be the best papa ever. Sorry to knock you off your throne if you're one of them now. I hate that for you. Um, I'm just really excited about this station in my life. And um, we, do, we just have a healthy family. My dad's my best friend and my toughest client. You know, we coach ministry and marketplace leaders all over the world. And he still kisses me on the cheek and tells me he loves me. And things are just good. I'm a very, very blessed man. I get emotional often during worship because I just feel so blessed and so favored by God. He's been so faithful to me. Anybody else? Amen. He's been so good to me. And I've, I've achieved a lot of success in the marketplace and ministry world. I'll talk about this. But I feel most successful when I'm successful in these people's eyes. And that's really what I want to talk about today. I want to start with a kind of a thought-provoking question. Maybe too early for you to think about this. But I'm hoping you'll join with me. The first crowd jumped right in there. Here's my question for you. What is success? Do you ever think about it? Have you ever tried to define it? Would you know it when you see it? Will you know it when you get there? Is it based upon our salary and title and socioeconomic status, our occupation? Is it based upon where we live? Down on the south side? What we wear? Is it how many Facebook followers we have? (laughs) Young lady said, no. Instagram friends we got. No, none of that. If we, if we lie and cheat and squash our way on, on the way to the top, is that success? Somebody tell me. No. If we burn the midnight oil seven days a week and we lose our family on the way to the top, is that success? What about churches? Is it nickels and noses and services and campuses and budgets and buildings? How do we quantify success? It's an issue I've wrestled with. I wrote a whole book on it, by the way, called Measuring Success. Because it's, it's been part of my own pilgrimage, my own journey to wrestle down the world's definition of success versus God's definition of success. Now, I'll tell you a story a little bit. I, was, I, was, I never wanted to be a pastor. I grew up in the real estate business. My dad's been in the real estate business for 50 years. I think that's seven recessions <laughs> that he's led through. And that's all I ever want to do. Came out of college, Sanford University in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, Probably the most controversial thing I'll say to you today is I am an Alabama fan. Yeah, I hear a few couple faithful fans back there. I feel like a total failure as a parent. My daughter's going to Auburn, pray for me. Um, No, I'm I'm cheering for her and excited about this new venture in her family. And I tell my kids, I'm training you to leave. Sooner the better. You know, but but I haven't always been the perfect dad. I haven't always been the perfect husband. Um, I, I've been successful in the world's eyes, pretty much everything I've ever touched. Came straight out of college. People asked me how long I'd been in the business. I said, well, really all my life. My kids had a cage, I mean a pack and play, you know, in the back office. My mom and dad were in the business together, started the business together 50 years ago. The year I was born, I was just grew up around the real estate business. It's all I ever wanted to do. Came out, I was a chip off the old block like my dad. I could sell. I was instantly successful. I was 25 years old making a six-figure income. That used to be a lot of money. And, and I was the top selling agent in our county. But I was teaching a college and career Sunday school class. Come on, somebody. And really, God brought revival to that whole Baptist church through our Sunday school class. Like rocked our worlds in the very best way. And I felt like God tugging on my heart to maybe be a pastor in the midst of worldly success. Walked in and told my dad, Dad, I feel like God could be calling me to be a pastor. And he gave me this big vote of confidence. He said, Sean, you do know David Koresh even thought he was doing God's will. (laughs) I'm not kidding. That's what he said. (laughs) Thank you, Dad. (laughs) He'd seen a lot of preachers fail. And new churches fail. He said, you know, a lot of people want to go out and start churches and they're not successful. Thank you, dad. (laughs) But God called me 
I couldn't deny it. So I went off to seminary, served a couple churches. Then we moved to Metro Atlanta and started a church. One other couple in our living room. I was 28 years old. I tell church planners all the time, don't start a church when you're 28. You're stupider than you think you are. <laughs> and I was. But in spite of me, God blessed. About three and a half years later, we we're running 1,000 people out of our living room. And I was feeling pretty good about myself. I was lying in bed with my wife one night and I said, honey, how do you think things are going? I don't know, man, if you've ever been there where you kind of ask your wife a question, but you're really fishing for a compliment. You ever been there? And I expected her, you know, to say something like, wow, this is awesome, Sean. You're an amazing man of God. It's a blessing to be seen in public with you. <laughs> you know, something like that. Instead, it was just real quiet. And she said, you really want to know what I think? Yeah. I said, ah, I think so. And she said, well, I don't like you very much right now. She said, I think you've allowed this church to turn you into a workaholic. She said, you're never home. And when you're home, you're not nice to me. And our first child, Hannah, she said, I'm, Hannah's nearly three and I'm not sure she knows you and I'm not sure I want her to know this version of you. She said, I've caught myself wanting the guy up on stage that's fun and energetic and life of the party, not the guy that comes home. She said, I'm not leaving, but I'm not happy. And I had not seen all of this, of course, Okay. Ladies, I love to tell you all the time, we men, like we really are that dumb. In case you think we're hedging it, like we really are that dumb. I've never had a man in all my consulting and coaching in 20 years now say, I totally saw it coming. <laughs> never, ever. We are that clueless. And I was that clueless. I didn't see, I thought everything was great. I really did. Did not see it. But on this night, like scales fell off my eyes and I began to repent to God, repent to my wife, I went back and told our church. I said, guys, I've made a mistake. I need to confess something to you that I've confessed to my wife and to our leaders. Boy, I had their attention now. <laughs> I said, I've made myself available to you at the expense and neglect of my family and I'm not gonna do it anymore. I'm not gonna be out more than two nights a week. If you wanna see me, it's gonna be during office hours. And my best gift to you is not to be at every event but to be in love with God and stay sane, centered, and married. Can I get a witness for pastors? And I, I thought they were gonna start throwing things. You know, instead we got the first standing ovation in one of my sermons ever. And two men came up to me and said, after the service and said, Pastor, glad you share what you share. We've been concerned about you. And I said, Matt, where you been? And we kind of took back our life, took back our leadership. And we grew but not at the expense of health. If you allow growth to happen at the expense of health, you will eventually implode. And it was out of that we started coaching, consulting with churches and then marketplace organizations around what we call our gears of growth framework, healthy culture, healthy team, healthy systems. It's great commandment, great commission in that order. Even churches, if you grow at the expense of health, eventually it'll cost you. It's important in the marketplace and in the ministry. And we started consulting, coaching out of a place of health and growth in that order. But honestly, it's, it's a daily battle. And our greatest danger in today's world is to exchange the world's definition of success for God's definition. It's one of your greatest dangers. So I wanna help us today. What is success? The good news is Jesus has not left us ignorant. It's all there. In his case, in red and white, he tells us what success, how he measures success in our lives. I want you to look with me in your Bibles. John chapter 15, verse five. If you got a smart device and you wanna read it on that, you can. Just don't end up in Facebook, be careful. All right, John chapter 15, verse five. This is Jesus talking. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. A lot of you are familiar with this passage, but I hope you're gonna see it in a new way today. He said, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. 
If you don't remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away, it withers, and such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. They're useless. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Not by what you know, but by what you do. As the Father's loved me, I've loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other. As I have loved you, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Now, in in John chapter 15, Jesus is continuing, I think, the most important sermon of his ministry. It's his last public sermon, and it begins in John chapter 14. It's in this sermon Jesus promises that he's going to go away and he's going to prepare a place for you and me, a place with many rooms, mansions, streets of gold. All of that stuff. It's in this sermon in John chapter 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's in this sermon, Jesus has earlier stated that he's gonna go away, but he's gonna send a comforter to live inside of us. To me, one of the great messages of Christianity that we don't talk about enough, especially in like Baptist-like circles, it's not that Jesus can just forgive us our sins. That's half the gospel. The other half of the gospel that gives me hope is that Jesus moves in us and gives us the power to live the Christian life. This is that sermon. So Jesus is just picking up his his intensity in this message and he's trying to show us his definition of success. What success looks like. Specifically, I just wanna talk about three. I could talk 20 out of this passage. But in light of time and because you've got Mexican on your mind now, I just want to give you three. Are you ready? You ought to write these down. You ought to type these in. If God speaks to you, you might want to write it down. All right, number one, Jesus reveals in this passage that our success is measured through our purpose. Our success is measured through our purpose, first and foremost. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Anybody who ever said the Bible is hard to understand doesn't read the Bible. Okay, this is really simple. He says, look, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Stay with me. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Most scholars believe that Jesus was not just a great expositor of the scriptures. That was one thing that attracted people to his teaching 2,000 years ago. But he was also a profound illustrator. And here he might have been holding a branch or holding a vine like this one. And he said, guys, here's what the Christ following life is all about. Here's what it means to follow me. See, I'm the vine and you're the branches and the fruit is what gets produced in and through you. And he depicts himself as this vine that sort of holds everyone and everything together and produces the life the vitality, the growth, as you and I stay connected to him. And he said, here's the deal. If you get connected from me, guess what happens to a grape that's been severed from the vine? It taints, it withers, it dies. So will happen to you and me. And yet so many times, a lot of us grew up in a church where we got our fire, spiritual fire insurance try to stay out of hell, and then we go try to live the Christian life in our own power. Jesus says, you, you, you can't, you're gonna die. You're gonna die if you turn the Christian life into a religion Amen. where you go pray a prayer and then you go try to live the life in your own effort. It will not work. Your job, your main responsibility is to stay connected to me. Notice Jesus says it's not our responsibility to produce the fruit or to grow or to multiply. He says, you only got one job, one job. Stay connected. Stay in love with me. Maintain a relationship with me and I'll produce the fruit. I'll help you multiply your influence, your impact, 
All good things will come through staying connected to me. That's your purpose. Don't overcomplicate it. Pharisees overcomplicate things. Jesus always simplifies things. He created just a few laws. The Pharisees had come along, complicated it. 613 laws they were trying to make the Israelite people follow, the Jewish people follow in the first century. They're sitting up on the edge of the seat. Jesus, out of all these laws in there, like what's the most important thing? Complicated. Jesus, Matthew chapter 22, verse 36, the scriptures record, what's the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your heart. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second's like it, love your neighbor, which you went on to say later, your neighbor is like the person of another race. Your neighbor is a person who doesn't behave or believe like you. They're from another political party. Got quiet in here. (laughs) Who vents on Facebook? That person, that's your neighbor. Now you're convicted, aren't you? (laughs) Love your neighbor as yourself. He says, all the law and the prophets. If you just get that right, okay? If you walked in here today thinking Christianity was complicated, it's not. It's simple. All you gotta do is love God and prove it by loving people. That's your purpose. It's not about what you do for a living. It's not about where you work, how much money you make, where you drive, what you wear. Success in his eyes is measured through living according to his purpose and staying connected to him. In fact, everybody else can think you're successful and you won't be successful in his eyes if you forget your purpose. To be in a relationship with him. We were put on this planet to be in a relationship with him. Now, this is cool. Also research this. Scientists tell us that no two grapes are exactly alike. Ever. There has never been, nor will there ever be, another grape just like this grape. But see, a a grape's responsibility is not to try to be like the other grapes. A grape's responsibility is just stay connected to the vine and become the best version of itself to grow fully to its potential. What a great parable for our lives. Hey, you know what? Our responsibility is not to grow and try to produce somebody else's fruit. Somebody produce somebody else's testimony to have somebody else's ability. You're like, Sean, yeah, I've I've, kind of heard that. Then why in the world are you so worried about keeping up with the Joneses? Who are the Joneses anyway? Does anybody even know who they are? Why, Why do you worry so much about the way your lawn looks? And about what people think about you. And why are you destroyed because somebody's clicked defriend or unfollow? Why does it ruin you? Because you you care more about what people think than what Jesus thinks. That's reality. You've forgotten your purpose. You're living for the applause of men and women, not the audience of one. And Jesus wants to bring you back to his purpose. To really get you focused on becoming the best version of yourself. The best thing you can do with your life is become the best version of you. That's all Jesus expects. He taught this in the parable of the talents. Remember the parable of the talents? Matthew chapter 25. It's a fictitious story with an eternal truth. He said there was a a master who gave servants different levels of talent. It was units of money back then, but it was according to their abilities. That's where we get our English word talent today. He said, one got five talents, one got two talents, and one got one talent. But their responsibility was equal to take what they had received, what they had been blessed with, and and maximize it from a stewardship perspective. And he criticized the ones that didn't, okay? In today's world, I believe there are five talent people, there are two talent people, and there are one talent people. I actually identify with the two talent people, okay? Okay? I don't know that I'm a five talent person or a one talent person. I'm just sort of kind of in the middle. All right, I'm from Alabama. (laughs) We're 48th on every national list. (laughs) Thank God for Mississippi and Louisiana. (laughs) 
We're just like right there hovering. Okay. I boasted to my kids, like I graduated 16th in my high school graduating class. There were only 64 of us. I graduated with a sub 3.0 GPA at college. All right, had to fight to get there a little bit. Caused some foolishness my first year. All right, I just identify with two talent people. I don't know if I'm best in the world. I don't know if I'm worse in the world. I'm just kind of in here. Anybody else kind of identify with that mentality? Well, if you think about it, like if you're a five talent person, like you're responsible for more because you've been given more. You know, as a two talent person, I sort of feel sorry for five talent people. (laughs) You're responsible for a lot. One talent people, I envy you. You're not responsible for a whole lot. I'm a two talent person that's overachieved. That's what I am. And I just want to use what I've been given for the glory of God. And I'm, I'm telling you, students, listen to me. It's freeing when you get your eyes on, you get freed up from what people think about and this click and that group and this guy and that girl and you stop worrying so much about what people think about you and you start becoming the best version of you. You become a more attractive person. It's, it's freeing. It, there's a confidence. There's a magnetism. I've watched my daughter Madison live this out in her peer groups. She made good relational choices. Good spiritual choices. She's had to unfriend a few people. Be unselected by some groups of people. But she'll tell you she has no regrets on that. At this stage in her life, entering into the new journey. And it'll be true at college, Madison. Don't you forget that. (laughs) Remember that, students. It's your purpose. It's your purpose. And thinking about this allows us to honor God no matter what we do for a living. A lot of you are struggling right now in the marketplace. Because you don't know your place. You don't know your title. You're, you're wondering if you're making a difference. You wonder if you shouldn't quit your go- job, go do something else. Colossians chapter three, verse 17 says, and whatever you do, and I would just put in parentheses, for a living, whether you work at home or you stay at home or outside the home, whether in word or deed, do it all. In the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We get an opportunity to sit now. We have a marketplace division by what we do and a ministry division by what we do. I call them shepherds on Sundays and shepherds between Sundays. And a lot of these CEOs and executive teams we work with and behind closed doors, they'll tell me they, 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 they struggle with significance. I'm talking about guys making a lot of money. They struggle with their sense of making a difference. And eternal fulfillment. But I'm quick to tell these guys, listen, you have a flock. God's given you responsibility over a group of people. Statistics tell us that if you're in leadership at work or you lead a team at work, like you're not just affecting people at work, you're affecting people at home. Statistics tell us if you work outside the home and when you return home, your first seven minutes in the home dictates the tone and temperature for the family the rest of the evening. Can I get a witness? Yeah. And the same's true at work. If, if the home life is bad and they kind of bring that to work, can I get a witness? So you, CEOs, executives, leadership, managers, you have influence. You have a flock. God's given you opportunity. Take advantage of it. And whether you're a CEO or you work behind a cash register at the convenience store right around the corner, you have opportunity every day. When I was a pastor, people would walk out into the lobby. I'm gonna stand out there today after the service. They'd walk out in the lobby and they'd say, Pastor, pray for me. Pray for my work environment. God will surround me with Christian friends. I'm like, no, that's what the church is for. That's your place to be surrounded by Christians. I'm going to pray God surrounds you with pagans. <laughs> dark. I want it to be dark around you. Because where it's darkest, the light has the greatest opportunity to shine. I want you to get patched up, sewed up, loved up, encouraged up, energized up, go back into the darkness and be light in the dark world. So is it dark in your workplace? Good for you. 
what an opportunity you have. You have more opportunity than I do to make a difference. Are you guys following me? This is your purpose. So success is measured through our purpose. Number two, success is measured through our priorities. Our success is measured through our priorities. Jesus says in verse five, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do, what's that next word? Nothing. That verse is not technically true, you know. It's not technically correct. I can do lots of things without Jesus. I can go to work without Jesus. You've done that. I can get on the highway without Jesus. I've seen you do that. I can parent without Jesus. I can be married without Jesus. I can pastor a church without Jesus. I can draw a crowd without Jesus. I can preach without Jesus. Lots of things I can do without Jesus. What's Jesus talking about then? He actually qualifies it in this sermon. Look down in verse 16. He says, you didn't choose me. I chose you and I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will, what? Last. Oh, that's it. So I might do some things that look successful in the world's eyes, but until I'm focused on his kingdom and his priorities, I won't be successful in his eyes. I can do lots of things that just won't matter in the lens of eternity. So my responsibility every day is, Lord, I have 1,440 minutes today. Which by the way, the, 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 the growing trend out there is to say, man, I just do not have enough time to get everything done. Do you really think God's will, he would give you not enough time to accomplish it? It's about priority. And when we're overextended and overwhelmed, it's usually because we've done it to ourselves. It's not something God's put on us. We gotta reorganize, restructure, reprioritize our lives. And that's what he wants to help us do, to keep his priorities. He gets our first time. He gets the first of our talent. He gets the first of our treasure. And we seek first his kingdom. We don't work to make a living. We work to be salt, to be light, to make an impact, to have influence. It's our mission field. It's our greatest opportunity. Pastor Matt's kicking off a new series next week. All right, we're coming out of our dens and hives in this post-pandemic environment. Who are you inviting to be here? As Pastor Matt kicks off this new series next week. You need to be thinking about that. You need to be thinking with eternal eyes and focused on eternity. God's priority has always been expressed through relationships. He said, my command is this, you love each other. Verse 12, he said, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. I alluded to it earlier, but I really believe at the end of the day, success is being loved and respected by those closest to us. Not by somebody out there, not in the world, on the world stage, but at home. Those closest that we work with, that we go to church with. Do they respect us? Let me tell you, some, as a dad who raised three teenagers, there were many times I had to walk out of their bedrooms and choose not to be liked. But I wanted to be respected. And them understand why I'm telling you what I'm telling you. The same at work. I want to be loved and respected by those closest to me, not those who are far away. And it's cool that when we pursue success God's way, loving him, loving, serving the people around us, like worldly success tends to come back around. Inc.com released statistics this past month that stated 41% of the American workforce is, has got one eye on another potential job. 41% are looking around at a potential another job. And a lot of them are thinking of taking a pay cut, working at a smaller company. And the primary objections and complaints are, 
They don't care about me and they don't know what's going on with me and I'm never encouraged and built into. Say it's not so if a Christian leader is sitting at the helm. Because we care about people, don't we? We love people, don't we? We serve people, don't we? We spur one another on toward love and good deeds, don't we? Those are the infectious cultures that especially young people want to work for in today's world. They'll take less money to be affirmed and developed and invested. Now, people don't want to be managed. They do want to be led. They do want to be invested into, developed, cheered on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you can do that. I can do that. So success is measured through his priorities in our lives. And then thirdly, and I'll close, success is measured through our passion. Success is measured through our passion. Verse 11 John 15, he says, I've told you all of this, not so you'd be a good person, a moral person, keep all the rules. No, no. I've told you all this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Wow. Jesus says, you know what I've told you, all that I've told you? It's not to keep you in the lines. It's not to make you a good moral person. I want you to have joy in your life. I want your joy to be so complete it overwhelms and overflows to other people. In other words, I want you to be a person of passion. I want you to be a person of joy, enthusiasm. I want you to keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. I want you to have zeal for the house of God. I want you to be a person of passion. When Jesus came on the scene 2,000 years ago, he was teaching out of the same book the Pharisees were. But thousands of people were leaving the teachings of the Pharisees and flocking to Jesus' sermons. Why? Same sermons. Passion. Conviction. Urgency. Peace. Gentleness. Joy. Faithfulness. Kindness. Self-control. Against such things, there are no law. Let's apply this to the church. In the Old Testament, New Testament, God's people are pictured as worshiping together, singing, raising their hands. They had tambourines in the church, (laughs) y'all. Stringed instruments. They had drums. They danced. (laughs) And in the first century, Acts chapter two, everybody in the world watched and thousands joined daily because it was a place of passion. You know why the church is struggling today? I see dead people. (laughs) Right back there. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Dead people. The church has a branding issue. Every organization, every leader, every entity has a brand. You have a brand. This church has a brand. The church has a brand. The church, the Christian church has a branding issue. When people think about us, they think about people who are for, I mean, against everything, Haters, prejudiced, plug in the blank, plug in the blank. We're not well thought of. Did you know this? Do you know this? We're not well thought of by non-Christian people. We have a branding issue. And we're fuddy-duddies. We're frankly boring. I want to change that. Anybody else want to change that? I'd love for us to be known as what, what we're for. We're for love. And we're for joy. And we're for peace and we're for patience and we're for kindness on Facebook and we're for gentleness and we're for self-control against such things. There are no law and we're people of passion and joy. And Jesus has forgiven me of all of my sin and moved into my life and redeemed me and changed me and made me a better man and a husband. And that gives me reason to celebrate. And forgive me if I get a little rambunctious in church, but I'm happy. And forgive me if I've got a little pep in my step Monday to Friday. Because God's moved into my life. If we lived that way, we would not have enough room for people in this room. You agree? Passion. Get some passion about you. Smile. Everybody look around. You've wanted to do that all day. Go ahead, look around. Just smile. Isn't everybody more attractive (laughs) when you smile? And in my faith, I'm learning that that joy, I can be a victim. I can talk about how hard it is, how oppressed we are. 
political, pandemic, racial, all this stuff going on. I, I, I can play the victim card or I can say, you know what? I'm not responsible for what I can't do. I am 100% responsible for who I am and what I can do. And I can live the fruits of the Spirit. I can be a person of joy and passion and enthusiasm. I can do everything I do for the glory of God. I can do that. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit, not a fruit of our circumstance. And once I realize that and it clicks and I start holding myself accountable, it changes everything about being a Christ follower. But honestly, it's like a daily struggle too to live that way and not lose it on people. You know what I'm talking about? Like near the Mount Gall Galleria Mall where I was yesterday, I almost lost it a couple of times. And, and you're reminded, I gotta keep my passion, maintain my poise in these days. Um, I told you I'm gonna be a grandfather. My daughter went off to school, came back, got engaged. She was living at home for a period of time before she went off to be married. So I, she moved in with her grandpuppy, my grandpuppy. Her name's Luna. She's a mutt. And a um, little bitty thing about this big, about this long, black. I don't have a picture of her, but it's already become a joke around my house, like this funny bond that Luna and I have formed. It's proof that I'm going to be a great papa. <laughs> Luna loves me and I love her. And everybody knows she's got like a soft spot in papa's heart. And, um, but she's been bad about chewing things up as a puppy around the house. Anybody had a dog like that? Bad about chewing things up. And so we already had two labs. So we ended up with three dogs in our house. The labs weren't really an issue till, till Luna came around. She just kind of instigated and stirred things up with those two. So previously we went away from home. When we left the house and it was going to storm outside, we'd leave the dogs inside downstairs in the finished area of the basement. But Luna had already proven the ability to chew some stuff up around the house. So we got her this little um, crate. It's a cage, but we called it a crate. <laughs> Politically correct, right? And so, so before we leave, we'd put her in this little crate and, and leave her in there until we got back. So this is right before the pandemic. We were going off to see the Avengers movie, the real long one, like three and a half hour long movie. We were getting ready to go and Trish said, hey, run downstairs and put Luna in her crate. And so I ran downstairs and Luna kind of walked in there and I went to close the gate and she kind of flipped around, looked up at me with those puppy dog eyes and I, I just couldn't do it, guys. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't, I couldn't imprison Luna. <laughs> and so I, I didn't like open it. I just didn't clasp it too, okay? <laughs> and everybody else was already in the car, so we left. So we go off to this long movie and we're about 10 minutes from home and my wife's sitting here and I'm driving and she's like, hope Luna's been okay in her crate. <laughs> Man, have you ever been there where you're like, should I fess up or just hope this works out? You know what I'm saying? I think it'll work out. I think it'll be okay. Let's keep it to myself. So I'm having this mental thing, you know, right there in that moment. And I decided to respond and I just said, well, um, Actually, I didn't put Luna in her crate. And I thought it'd go, <laughs> you know, and it got real hot on this side of the car for some reason. <laughs> and she didn't really say anything, but I said, I said, uh, I literally said, my kids can testify to this. They were there in the car. I said, I trust Luna. <laughs> it's a joke in our family now, and you'll see why in a moment. So, so we, so, so, but then, then your mind gets to thinking, are you with me men on this? At least men. My mind starts thinking, I said, okay, what if, this, what if something did happen? So by the time we get home, like I'm the first out of the car very quickly. I hit the garage floor and run to the door because I, just in case I can pick up, you know, right quick or something if she's chewed a little something up. Little did I know, when I walked in the door, this was my view. Okay, I've got a picture of this. Yeah, that's leather. <laughs> Ladies, it's one month old. Literally, they had gotten to frolicking and playing, all three of them. They had chewed to the spine of the sofa, to the spine of the sofa. And that's the stuffing on the inside. So God is my witness, okay? I, 
I pull the door back to it and I turn around and face my family like this. And I, I say, babe, babe. It's always babe, soften it up. Babe, it's worse than you can imagine. I'm not joking. Luna's gone crazy. Don't lose it. <laughs> she said, oh, you're kidding me. You're kidding me. You're kidding me. And open the door and there, there it is in all its glory. I mean, what, what, what do you say, ladies? How, how can you possibly? You know what I'm saying? What do you say? So I just let it. And to my wife's credit, God rest her soul. I'm just kidding. <laughs> to my wife's credit, she says, kids, go get garbage bags. You know, she wanted to lose it, but she kept her poise, you know. And as the kids went upstairs, I started to begin to pray the, the, the prayer, Father's prayer, you know, Father, <laughs> thy kingdom come, that will be done on earth as is in heaven. You know, it was really fine. And, and we picked it up. And so I turned to her, I said, baby, I'm sorry, this is on me. She said, Really? And we got in there and we cleaned it up and all that. Now, we've had some arguments over the years. We call it intense fellowship. <laughs> but, but, but we have learned over time that pursuing success God's way, maintaining your passion, keeping your poise, like it, it, it it's not only benefits the kingdom, it benefits you. It benefits your marriage. It benefits your children. And I lose it less than I used to. And I'm stewarding joy that comes from the inside more than I used to. And things that used to bother me and aggravate me and frustrate me and knock me off center and discourage me and depress me, like get to me less because he's in me. And I'm pursuing success his way. And other people may have all their opinions, maybe, but at the end of the day, I want to be successful in his eyes. Who's with me? I would love to just pray for us as we go away today that the Lord will help you take your eyes off everything that's going on in our world, get your eyes back up on him and measure success God's way. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this reminder today. Thank you for hope that you can change us, that we can find success and significance in your eyes that we can make a difference on Sundays and between Sundays, that we can be salt and light, that there's potential for us, there's opportunity for us, the darker it is around us to be missionaries for you. Maybe you're here today, you've never asked Jesus to come into your life to be your savior and Lord, your forgiver and leader. I want you to know you can't do this. You're severed from the vine right now. And your decision today is just to get connected to the vine. Ask Jesus to come into your life. Be your savior, your Lord, your forgiver, your leader. Ask him to come in, take over your life. Give up control to him. I'm telling you, you're not giving up anything. You're gaining everything. Lord, for those of us who need to come back there today, we confess to you, the world is yelling at us what success potentially looks like. We want to be successful in your eyes. We want to be successful your way, according to your purpose, according to your priorities and with your passion and poise in this world. We pray that in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,